Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Ward Carroll, the Naval Institute's Director of Outreach and Marketing. Joining me is my co-host, Proceedings Editor-in-Chief, Bill Hamlet. Hello, Bill. Morning, Ward. So we have a great guest today, and we probably want to get right to him. Yeah, we definitely do. So uh, today is the 1st of December, so the December issue of Proceedings is up. It's published. It's out. And uh, there's a lot of great content in it. Uh, the probably the article that I think that's going to get the most attention uh, for this month's issue is by Secretary Bob Wark, uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, and former Undersecretary of the Navy, retired Marine Corps Colonel, and also the chair of the board of the Naval Institute's uh, Board of Directors. Uh, so joining us from uh, Northern Virginia today is uh, Secretary Bob Wark. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Ward. It's great to be here. Hey, Bob. Good to see you as always. Great to see you, sir. Um, I'm sorry. So that, <laughs> it's, it's good to see you both. So your article is titled, A Slavish Devotion to Forward Presence Has Nearly Broken the U.S. Navy. I'm going to repeat it for our listeners because it's a, it's a long title, but it's a really important one. A Slavish Devotion to Forward Presence Has Nearly Broken the U.S. Navy. I want to start by reading a little bit from the opening page of the article. You write, in the 1980s, no one doubted that the nearly 600-ship U.S. Navy was bred and ready for war. Its mission was not easy, but it was simple. Everyone from senior admirals to junior sailors knew if push came to shove, their job was to put steel on target and the Soviet Navy on the bottom. The service locked its sights on the adversary. You go on to say, thankfully, as fate and an ably conceived grand strategy would have it, the Navy never faced a test of arms against the Soviet Navy, but the victory it helped win proved de de decisive. It led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. The only downside to this happy turn of events was the U.S. Navy found itself without an adversary against which to set its sights and train to defeat. So with that as the backdrop here, and with the title about forward presence and how forward presence has nearly broken the U.S. Navy, uh, tell our listeners what what motivated you to write this, and uh, what are the, what are the major themes in it? Well, <clears throat> again, thanks for having me on today. You know, forward deployment is in the Navy's DNA from the very birth of our republic and the birth of the United States Navy. Uh, the Navy has tended to be forward deployed around the world, protecting U.S. interests. Um, Peter Swartz, who's a retired Navy uh, captain, wrote a superb historiography or history of the different types of deployment models the Navy has had. Now, I would argue up through, you know, from the end of World War II up through the end of the Cold War, the Navy generally had a lot of ships. It dipped down real fast and hard after World War II you know, going from about 6,600 ships, if you can believe it, to about 1,100 by 1954. And, uh, but after that, after Korea came about, it kind of steadied out. And there was always enough ships to have forward deployed ships around the world, protecting and guarding U.S. interests, and still have enough in, you know, in reserve, ready to go and surge in case of a war. And at the end of the Cold War, when the fleet started to um, contract after the post-Cold uh, demobilization, the Navy strived to keep as almost as many ships out and about as it did when it had a 600-ship Navy at the end of the Cold War. And for anybody who was around in the 1990s, they can remember the frenetic operational and personnel tempo. And it was, my basic thesis was, up until the end of the Cold War, forward presence was one of the missions of the Navy. Uh, Stansfield Turner, who was the president of the Naval War College, wrote a great article in 1974 that said, here are the four missions, canonical missions of the U.S. Navy, strategic deterrence, sea control, power projection, and forward presence. And he described forward presence as a mission. <clears throat> and my thesis is up until the end of the Cold War, we treated it as one of our missions. And after the end of the Cold War, because we did not have an adversary to set our sights on, 
and we were trying to stabilize uh, the size of the fleet, we re the Navy started to rely more and more on forward presence as a force sizing construct. Uh, the thinking was, hey, if we can convince the Office of Secretary of Defense that we need to have these ships out to protect uh, U.S. interests, that that would provide a floor for the fleet and uh, the Navy would stop contracting. And slowly but surely, uh, the Navy started touting the advantages of forward presence until it became uh, the, I argue, the strategic concept of the Navy, that it was elevated to such a point that we were doing forward presence for forward presence sake. And we stopped thinking of it in terms of a mission and having some type of process that said, okay, what is the mission we want to accomplish? How many ships would we need to try to accomplish this mission? How long would be, we be willing uh, to pursue the mission? None of that happened. <clears throat> and as a result, I argue, we went from a readiness culture uh, in the Cold War, you know, we need to be ready to go to war tomorrow, to a deployment-centric culture. And the deployment pattern became the engine that drove the Navy. And as the Navy shrank, and we kept doing this, inevitably, uh, the material readiness of the fleet, and particularly the surge force, started to uh, degrade. Uh, Phil Belisle, Admiral Phil Belisle, wrote a famous report, at least in the Navy, the Belisle Report, which basically warned in 2010, look, if we continue this type of operational pace in peacetime, we will burn out. And he was really focused on the surface fleet because the surface fleet as early as 2010 was already having a lot of readiness problems because of the demands of forward presence. And he was right. You know, by 2017, I would argue the material and training readiness of the fleet had degraded precipitously and led to four accidents in the seventh fleet area of responsibility, the two collisions that everyone remembers leading to the loss of 17 sailors' wives of lives. Um, and the Navy, I think, has started to recognize, look, we need to have a better balance. We need to prepare for war. That has always been the Navy's kind of signature. Uh, I mean, a hundred years ago, Admiral Sims, president of the Naval War College, said the mission of the U.S. Navy in peacetime is preparing for war, period, end of story. Um, and I think the Navy lost that and as a result has gone through uh, some travails here recently which uh, call into question whether or not the Navy is really ready as an institution to go to war if war started tomorrow. So I wanted to sound the alarm because to me, the data is pretty compelling. It's right in front of our eyes. All you have to do is believe what you're seeing. Uh, and that was the motivation behind writing the article. So I, Bob, you mentioned the Cold War era, which is when all of us on the conversation here served. Um, so I'm thinking that the argument that was put forward by my COs and the various fighter squadrons I was in is presence is training. You know, going on deployment, doing cyclic ops in and of itself is pre preparations preparation for war. So where in your mind do you, do you segment that uh, and, and sort of kneecap that logic? Generally, uh, in my view, some of the presence mission have really turned into presence for presence sake. Um, I mean, the 2007 cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power essentially made the claim that forward presence protects the global system. And that's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty expansive uh, goal. And you could justify almost any deployment uh, under that type of rubric. And I think over the course of time, uh, a lot of these presence missions actually burn combat readiness. It's a little bit different, as you said, in the aviation community because they are doing cyclic ops, et cetera. But uh, this has especially been hard on the surface community. 
Um, the submarine community has been doing an awful lot of different, you know, they go out, do real time uh, ISR missions, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance missions. Uh, and, you know, they're out kind of doing their thing. But uh, on the surface Navy side, I believe if you read the strategic readiness review that happened after the collisions in the Western Pacific and the Bilal report, surface the surface community really burns readiness when they go out on a lot of these missions. And so uh, to me, the, the way you go about this is OSD and the Navy, you'd ask the COCOMs, okay, you're gonna ask for forward presence for the entire year. You're going to tell us how much forward presence you would like to see from naval vessels over the course of the next fiscal year. And it would go to a board in OSD and they would judge them as missions. Okay, what is the exact thing you're trying to accomplish on this mission? Uh, how long are you willing to perform the mission? When will you know if you've accomplished the mission? Um, and then you would say, here is what you are going to get over the course of the year. Now, of course, there's going to be emergent issues and uh, missions that come up. And uh, the big thing is what the Navy was forced to do is to degrade readiness in the surge forces to keep all of the ready ships out. And that ward is really what happened. Almost all of the ready ships in the Navy were out on presence missions. The ships that were ready to surge in case war came on the uh, Korean Peninsula or something happened in uh, the Taiwan Straits or something happened in Yukon, it was the surge fleet that was really, really hurting. The thing that just got me the most was when in the strategic readiness review after the collisions, it said uh, deviation of standards became normalized because you just had this frenetic operational pace. The ships couldn't train on their wartime missions. It was always, you know, you have to get out there. You have to make a fawn ops. You have to, uh, you know, you have to train with the uh, allied Navy. And it, the, by the Navy's own estimation, it became difficult for the COs of the ship and certainly the commanders of the fleet to understand what was happening to readiness. <clears throat> and uh, it seems as though the Navy has really taken that to heart uh, and is trying to moderate uh, what's happening. The most recent uh, publication of MWP-1, Naval Warfare Pub-1, doesn't even mention forward presence. It talks in terms of naval diplomacy. Um, and then, of course, CNO Gilday has said, look, the number one mission for every sailor is preparing the ship and making sure that we're ready for war. Um, and this has always been kind of the Navy's thing. As NWP-1 says, look, it's unlike the Army where you kind of gather your forces and then you deploy, then you do our SOI, reception, staging, onward movement, and integration. You know, as soon as you, uh, as soon as the lines are dropped, the ship is operational. It is ready. It should be ready for war the moment it leaves the pier. So the demands on the Navy are a little bit different than, than the other uh, services that, you know, prep, then go, then get ready for combat. <clears throat> and then uh, perform their combat mission. So um, in my view, you do have to look at each of these ward as a mission. And then you go through the steps and say, is this mission worth doing? I remember one time when I was the Undersecretary of the Navy, Southcom asked for a ship uh, to participate in a naval review uh, of uh, Columbia. And uh, the Navy came back and said, look, we're really tight. We can send down a frigate. And the word came back, we don't want a frigate. We want an Aegis cruiser with helicopter capability because we don't want uh, the South, South American navies to believe that we think that they are, you know, uh, in some way less important than other navies around the world. 
And we argued against it. We said, look, this is a misuse of this asset. But in the end, we sent down a Ticonderoga class cruiser with a helicopter uh, for some, you know, nice to have um, presence operation. And to me, that was the bad call then. And I would hope that we would never make a call like that in the future. So, sir, let me just jump on that for a second, because that, that's a really important point. You said that, you know, Southcom requested, so this is, gets to the COCOM request, the appetite, the demand signal, which, as you pointed out in the article, has just been constant or growing over time, while the number of ships in the U.S. Navy uh, after the Cold War went from just about 600 down to under 300 now, right? So the, the, the forward presence demand signal has not changed largely, uh, but the, uh, you, you know, the supply of that of that signal, the supply of that of that you know, you know force has dropped in half. So that's a supply and demand problem. But in that particular example of you know Southcom asking for an Aegis cruiser with helicopter uh, for a, a naval parade, uh, nice to have, as you pointed out. And the Navy or the Department of the Navy, you you were the undersecretary at the time, said um, you know misuse of this very important asset. Uh, but the decision was you know th that that opinion of the Navy was overridden. By who? Uh, by the Secretary of Defense, who uh, approves all requests for forces. And uh, it's the process. If we don't change the process, we won't get out of this problem. Um, you know, the COCOMs uh, obviously uh, would like to have Naval forces there present all the time uh, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but they don't have a checkbook to balance. So, you know, it's unconstrained demand. Uh, if you add up all of the demands, it would require about 130 ships out all the time. And, you know, when you only have 290 ships, when 130 of your ships are out on forward presence missions, uh, you don't have a lot of bandwidth left for training the surge forces and making sure that they're constantly ready. Or even just the maintenance of them. Uh, the maintenance is the thing that I worry the most about. Um, and again, uh, this really, the biggest problem manifests itself in the surface Navy. You know, the nuclear-powered aircraft carriers are always going to get the maintenance dollars they need. Can't afford to have any type of a issue there. Uh, the submarine force, same thing. You cannot afford to have any bad maintenance. Um, so... The surface community just as the third in priority line and they're the ones that really suffer when you go into the yard and uh, your yard period extends and then there's a surf there's a presence mission or a mission and the navy has to kind of fill it and so you're shuffling ships around uh but as i said by the Navy's own account. I mean, I'm just taking this from the investigations that occurred after the horrific accidents in the 7th uh, Fleet Area of Responsibility. Uh, the Navy said, look, uh, it just, you know, deviation from standard became normalized because you were just constantly trying to get the ships out on mission. Um, now, when I was the deputy, I would chat with as many surface warfare officers and submarine officers, well, any Navy officer, really, because this was uh, concerning me. And, uh, you know, this is just anecdotal evidence. But I would say almost to a man or woman, they were saying, wow, we're, you know, the pace, uh, the amount of time we spend away, uh, the lack of time we have to really do good maintenance, the lack of time we have to do really high-end combat training uh, is not where they think the Navy needs to be. Uh, and as I said, I am not anti-forward presence. It's always been a mission of the Navy, and it can be very, very helpful. Uh, all I'm saying is I don't like what forward presence is doing to the Navy at this point. And as you pointed out, uh, 
built. You know, it's supply and demand. We actually do that with our submarine force. We basically say these are how many submarines we have available for mission. Um, and I think we ought to have a supply uh, uh, dominated model uh, for the entire Navy. Uh, what to help it get back into the material readiness state that it needs to be in case war comes. So I, I think when you say that, Bob, the, the quick fix to my mind is to stop allowing the COCOM's direct report to SECDEF, right? So you get the service chiefs um, in between those two in some way that, you know, is, is meaningful. Um, because right now the ser service chiefs are relegated, are relegated to the uh, train equipped uh, and, uh, and man, right? Or man training equipped guys. Um, and so they really don't get a vote in terms of op tempo or whatever necessarily. They're, they're kind of an opinion in the mix. And when you were talking about this, this how we would broker presence, you know, some sort of a, a gathering where all of the COCOMs would, would get together, I guess, and, and sort of say, I need X. Um, you know, now before that meeting, the staffs have been burnt out to say X equals one, everybody. Are we getting that? And so your careers and your fit reps are predicated against me getting one, 1.0. 1 and so whatever the logic is, whatever adjectives we need to use, whatever teary-eyed stuff we got to put in there, you better do it. Because um, I don't want to be relegated to 0.5 or I certainly don't want to insult our hosts here, you know, the Argentinian Navy or whomever. So I, I, I don't, in terms of what happened after the, the, uh, the comprehensive review or so, if, you know, the other crises we've had in recent years, I'm hearing anecdotally as you are, op tempo isn't reduced. Um, material readiness is still a huge issue and, and they kind of pushed the paper around and, 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 and said, yeah, it's all fixed now. You know, we fired the ship boss, we fired seventh fleet, we fired um, Pacific Actually. fleet. Um, and, and uh, you know, some of these folks we know pretty well. And uh, we had actually uh, Admiral Alcoin on the podcast uh, sort of saying the CR wasn't C. You know, again, trying to be an honest broker about who did we fire and under what auspices did we do that? So I think there's some asterisks on what happened after the collisions of 2017 to begin with. But what do we need to do fundamentally in terms of reporting chains to affect what you've teed up here, even in the most basic way, immediately? Um, well, first of all, as I said, nothing happens unless the process we have now, where the COCOMs come in for requests for forces, they go into the uh, joint staff, joint staff looks at them. Um, as deputy secretary, I wasn't in that line. It goes directly from the joint staff. The, it's the orders book, and it comes up to the secretary of defense. And the secretary of defense then signs off on every one of these uh, things. Uh, the bottom line is we don't say no enough to the COCOMs. We don't say exactly what is the mission you are trying to accomplish. And, you know, when you get a hand wave and says, well, if I have a ship out there, it's going to deter Iran. Say, really? Um, how is it going to deter Iran? Is it going to deter Iran doing malign activities throughout the Middle East? Uh, do you really believe that Iran is close to initiating a war against the GCC com uh, countries? Um, there needs to be a lot more back and forth. And that's what I envisioned when I said you need to have a process. You're not going to really be able to put the service chiefs between the COCOMs and the Sec def. That is the chain of command, and that's not going to work. But you could put uh, the S Secretary of the Navy and the CNO of the Navy, the Department of the Navy, as part of a board that looks at requests with a jaundiced eye and say, look, at this point in time, repairing the material and training readiness of the fleet is a higher priority than a nice-to-have presence mission. 
Now, I'm sure the COCOMs would come in and say, hey, work, you're full of crap. We never just ask for nice to ask missions. But I would just point out that every single request that comes up, the, the, the COCOM puts down a risk. And in every single case, it's if you don't approve this presence mission, the risk is high. And I just don't buy it. I didn't buy it as the deputy secretary. I certainly don't buy it now. I just believe we should have much more rigorous review of demands for naval forces, recognizing the state of readiness and training uh, that the Navy is in right now. Uh, I think I think most people would agree it's not where it should be and that we need to improve. Um, so uh, I think, you know, in my article, I say, to me, the Navy has all, well, let me back up a little. In 1954, the Navy was adrift. The Department of Air Force, brand new uh, department in the Department of Defense was ascendant. Uh, at one point in the 50s, the Air Force was getting almost 50 cents on every dollar being allocated by the Department of Defense. Uh, the Navy had just lost the USS United States, its big super carrier. Uh, carrier aviation was actually fighting for its lives, leading to a revolt of the admirals. Um, the number of ships had fallen, as I said, from about 6,600 at the end of World War II down to about 1,100 in 1954. And Samuel P. Huntington writes a seminal article in the U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings. And essentially it said, Navy, snap out of it. Uh, every service has to have a strategic concept. And the strategic concept has to align to the national policy of the United States. It has to align to the strategic environment. And if it doesn't align, you're not gonna get money. So you are still using sea control as your primary mission to justify the Navy, but there is no Navy out there to fight. So he recommended changing the strategic concept to transoceanic power projection along the literal of Eurasia. Now, the other thing he said, you know, he talked a lot about the strategic concept and how the Navy had to go out and deliberately uh, talk about its strategic concept. And this is where I think things went wrong. Uh, the Navy took that to its institutional heart. Uh, of all the services, the Navy spends more time trying to explain why we need a Navy then the Air Force explains why we need an Air Force and the Army explains why we need an Army or the Marine Corps, why we need a Marine Corps. And if I, I think you can trace it right back to that 1954 article. So at the end of the Cold War, the Navy started to look for a new strategic concept. And it went through four flights. You know, Flight Zero was from the sea, 1992. And it described forward presence in much the same way that uh, Stansfield Turner. It was one of the missions, sea control, power projection, strategic deterrence, and sea lift being the others. Um, but simultaneous to its publication, the Department of Defense approved the Navy's request to size the carrier force on forward presence requirements rather than war fighting requirements. And this is where forward presence shifted from being a mission to a force sizing construct for the Navy. That was flight zero. Flight one was forward from the sea, 1994. And in 1994, the Navy started to talk about the virtues of forward presence in a different way, saying that forward presence in and of itself would prevent war. And it was a pretty, in my view, a pretty stunning argument saying that just being out there would prevent war. Whereas before we would say, look, we have a specific deterrent mission. We don't like what we're seeing going on in North Korea. So we're going to surge forces out there and we're going to send a signal uh, with amphibious ships, with aircraft carriers. We're going to send a signal to the North Koreans. We are ready to pound the crap out of you if you get out of line. So it was a specific specific mission for a specific duration for a specific reason the navy wasn't thinking hey if we just send ships out we're going to prevent war more broadly at least 
up until 1994. Then comes the 2007 Cooperative Strategy for 21st Century Sea Power, and it goes even a step further. It says that forward presence protects the global system. So you go from a mission, then you go to a foresizing construct, then you go to forward presence prevents wars, to forward presence defends the entire global system. So by 2007, in essence, I argue, forward presence became the strategic concept of the Navy. Uh, I have a quote in the article from Secretary Ray Mavis that said, presence is what we do. Presence is, defines what we are. And he's talking about the Navy. And in my view, the strategic concept of the Navy has always been prepare for war. We're ready to sortie and go on a moment's notice. And when we get there, the bad guys are going to regret, regret that we're arriving. So in my view, you know, our strategic concept in the U.S. Navy should be parabellum, prepare for war. When back in the 1980s, I remember talking with uh, Navy officers how we would do uh, flushes of attack submarines uh, with full war loads, with 48 hours notice. Boom, out they go. Every time a carrier went across the Atlantic, they were dodging the Eeyore sats and the Roar sats. They were MCON until they get to the fjords in Norway. They'd light up and the Soviets would say, what? Where did these guys come from? You know, everything was really focused on the fight and really focused on demonstrating to the Soviets, look, we want you to know we're coming. And we're glad you know we're coming. We're coming whether you know it or not. And when we get there, we're ready for bear. That, to me, is the strategic concept of the U.S. Navy. And it's very simple. It just, everybody says, okay, uh, getting ready for war is more important than going out on a, you know, a good, a nice to have forward presence mission. Uh, and Ward, it's not universal. Like you said, for the carrier force, they do a lot of training. That's very good on the cyclical ops. Submarine force does a lot of training. Um, but we could do a lot better as a Navy, I think preparing for a potential war in the Western Pacific. But sir, so, so two points. Uh, one, it, it, it's amazing you, you sort of walked the dog there on the, the strategic development from uh, from the sea, forward from the sea, cooperative strategy for maritime, you know, and how forward presence has has grown its, in its importance in the, the strategic thinking of the Navy. Uh, it's almost like uh, we, we, you know, the, the Navy by using forward presence has both, you know, cured cancer and solved world, world hunger at the same time. Um, but it, you know, it, it's come at a huge cost as the Navy has drawn down, and that that demand signal has not drawn down at all. Uh, you know, the Navy is spending more and more time out there and less time back maintaining and and training. Uh, for combat capabilities rather than just for forward presence capabilities. Um, and I wanted to make the point, and this is something that I always thought uh, during my active duty time and, and particularly watching the, the conversations, uh, you know, in proceedings over the last few years, especially after the 2017 collisions is, you know, presence is important, but I think your adversaries and your and your uh, allies get inured to it at a, at a certain point, right? If, if you're always there, do the North Koreans really even pay attention? Do the Iranians pay attention? Do they find a way around it? Um, whereas from time to time, surging a larger force and showing an incredible capability and then going away, I think that's more unnerving to an adversary than to just see, you know, a, a constant, you know, small U.S. Navy force that is out there and around, in and around, um, that, you know, then, you know, you make the point of, of uh you know, during the Cold War, getting carrier strike groups or multiple carrier strike groups ready to go and then surging them up to the fjords of Norway or up to the, you know, off the Kamchatka Peninsula um, and kind of surprising the, the Soviets when we arrived there, that sent a, a, a much stronger message. Yeah, I didn't go into it in uh, the article uh, simply because, uh, yeah, I was running out of space quite, quite Yeah, quite. I limited your space. Sorry about that. But uh, no, I. Uh, I believe that a demonstration model 
is just as effective as a perpetual presence model. Pricking up on what you said, Bill, where we demonstrate the capability to surge into a theater and we demonstrate capabilities there. And that to me sends a much more powerful signal to both our adversaries and our allies. The allies say, hey, they're coming. And when they come, they're gonna be able uh, to hold their own. Um, Paul Wolfowitz said this in the 19, uh, early 1980s. He said, you know, presence really wasn't to deter the Soviet Union. Presence was to reassure our allies. And so presence helps that without question. Uh, just knowing, you know, they're inside the missile ring. And it's always when you're talking with your allies, look, we know you're inside the Chinese missile ring. We're pre going to pretty much stay outside, but trust us, we're going to come. Uh, demonstrating an ability to go in and operate uh, sends a very strong signal to our allies. So again, I want to emphasize, I'm not anti-forward presence. I am pro considering forward presence a mission and being much more deliberate in when we send ships out and balancing those requirements with making sure the fleet is ready for war. Yeah, Bob, we're getting a little short on time, but I know a, a lot of our readers and, and uh, listeners and viewers will have this question on their mind, which is there's another side to the equation of supply and demand, which is in, just increase the supply, right? And so over several administrations now, we've seen almost a, uh, it, it's like a, uh, a wanton dance uh, at the start of a new administration to describe how many ships the U.S. Navy should have. Should it be 295? Should it be 300? 313? Should it be 355? But we've never moved the needle for, what, 15, 20 years now uh, or more. The, the needle has not gone up above 300. Uh, we're nowhere near the 355 that was promised, you know, at the beginning of the previous administration. Um, and, you know, that's not a that's not a political statement. That's just a, that's the fact. Right. And the Navy wanted 355. The, the president wanted 355. You know, we didn't get back above 300 yet. Um, and you, you know, as the deputy secretary of defense, you are in charge of the, you know, are sat at the top of the acquisition process. So talk about that for a minute. Like, is the is it possible to even move the needle? Can we get to a, a larger fleet? Can we build in, in the current environment, the constraints that we're facing, you know, is it possible for the U.S. Navy to grow, to get bigger so that we have a bigger supply on the supply and demand equation? Well, the 2020s is not going to be a great decade to try to grow the Navy. You know, you've got the Columbia SSBN program. That is the number one acquisition priority in the Department of Defense the number one acquisition priority in the Department of the Navy. The Navy will bear any price and, you know, any burden to make sure that the Columbia is built and we have a viable strategic deterrent at the end of the 20s. That thing is going to be a black hole in the U.S. Navy program. Uh, generally, we have trouble with first ships of class. So we should not be surprised if we have overruns in the first ship and possibly the second ship of class. We've got to pay that. At the same time in the 2020s, we have to recapitalize the strategic sea lift fleet. Most of the vessels are going to age out. You know, they'll be 35 or 40, maybe even 50 years old. Now, we may need a different sea lift fleet in the 21st century than we did in the latter half of the 20th. That's to be decided but that's gonna be another draw on U.S. Navy resources. Um, and it looks like right now, best case, we're going to have a flat budget for at least the next several years. And as everyone has said, on a flat budget, given the other priorities in the Department of Defense and Department of the Navy, I just don't foresee a large shift in departmental resources to allow the Navy to grow appreciably in the 20s. Now, once we get into the FFGX, the Constellation class, um, you know, you could easily see us over time ramping up 
to three, four, or even five ships a year uh, if we can keep cost control on that platform. And that will help us uh, grow the Navy. But I don't think we should feel that we're going to be getting a 355 ship Navy anytime soon. So I agree with you there. Now, on the other side of the coin, as the fleet grows, you'll have more ships available for President's mission. The way we did it uh, in when I was the Deputy Secretary is we said, okay, COCOMs, tell us the floor. Tell us the forces that you feel you need to have in theater on a pretty persistent basis to establish a minimal level of deterrence in your theater against the primary threat that you are faced with. Then we went to the services and we said, tell us the ceiling. And what we said, this is the number beyond which you start eating into the readiness of the overall force. So we would have the floor for the COCOMs and hopefully the ceiling from the uh, uh, service chiefs. And OSD would never allow the number of ships to go above the ceiling. That went away, or maybe they're still doing it. I don't think they are, but that was one of the ways we tried to get to this point where, look, the COCOMs are going to ask for what they feel is the minimum deterrent uh, that they need to have in theater, as they should. Um, but you've got to balance the demands based on the supply. And as the fleet grows, even if it grows slowly, uh, then being able to meet some of these presence missions will be easier. Uh, but for right now, given where the Navy finds itself after the collisions in uh, the Western Pacific and the most recent uh, incident with the Connecticut, I think that the time is now to say, look, we're really going to focus on training and we're really going to focus on material readiness. And that is what I hear Sino Gilde saying. That is what we want to concentrate on, which is really, really great to hear. Um, any, any chance, sir, of, uh, of spending the money that the Navy has uh, more efficiently? So some of our listeners and you know, proceedings readers will say, well, you know, Zumwalt, we, we ended up with three very expensive destroyers, not the 20 something that we were going to build. They each cost billions of dollars and their weapon system is not effective. LCS turned out to be so, you know, incredibly expensive for a class of ships or two classes of ships, not as effective as they need to be with mission modules still years uh, to come. Uh, you know, look at cost overruns on a number of other programs. You know, look at the F-18 Super Hornet turning into a tanker because the Navy didn't keep S-3s or, or fueled a new tanker. And so you're burning hours on, on your, uh, you know, essentially your, uh, your Ferrari doing a mission that's really made for an F-150. Uh, so, you know, there's got to be some aspect of this where the, this, the Navy spends its money more efficiently uh, to A, maintain and B, build a force, uh, you know, so that it can meet its mission demands, both, both its, its peacetime mission demands, but also more importantly, its wartime readiness demands. Yeah, I'd be reluctant to try to dive into the Navy program and say, hey, this is the way I'd spend your money. Um, all of the service chiefs are faced with a big, big problem. You know, essentially, when the Trump administration came in, they said we're probably going to shoot for three to five percent real growth above inflation. Uh, and all of the services made their plans for the 2020s based on that assumption. And that assumption no longer holds true. Uh, we're going to have flat budgets. At least that's the guidance from OMB at this point. That may change. Uh, so every one of the services is really, really strapped uh, to keep a viable program going on a flat budget. As you both know, uh, both operations and maintenance spending and personnel spending rises faster than the rate of inflation. You need to have about 3% growth, maybe 3.5% growth, just to keep up with the inflation in your O&M and personnel costs. So the way you need to look at it is, if we're on a flat budget and we're not getting even inflation, 
then you're losing 3% buying power every year, year over year. And it just makes your program very, very difficult to ma maintain coherence. So uh, I'm not going to try to do <laughs> see no guilty and uh, Secretary Del Toro's job. Um, I just acknowledge that they're faced with a very difficult problem. Yeah, it's, it's a hard job. job. Your point, Bill, is, look, if you go into the Air Force, the Air Force would say, look, all of these squadrons that we're sending out, you know, it's cutting into our readiness. Uh, every single one of the services has a story to tell. Uh, so uh, the one thing that the Navy could do, Secretary Del Toro and CNO Gilde could go to Secretary Austin and say, Secretary Austin, we need a reprieve. We need your help on forward presence of naval forces for some period of time. Uh, so because we're concerned about the material readiness of the fleet, for example, and just give some examples. I remember, you know, when uh, Secretary, well, General Mattis at the time, he was the COCOM of CENTCOM, uh, and he wanted two aircraft carriers in the Gulf all the time. And we would go back to the Department of Defense and we would say, we are literally burning the electrons out of the out of the reactors you know if we keep doing this by 2019 we're not gonna have any gas left in our uh, our aircraft carrier fleet this is you know we get do we really need to have two carriers out there all the time uh but we kept them out for a long period of time and it wasn't until i think you know just navy going back and back and back and saying this is really really setting us up for potential failure in the late uh, uh, the late teens, and we finally got rid of the second carrier. But it's tough. I mean, uh, it's tough having these arguments with the COCOMs because they make compelling cases. You know, they come in and say, well, "Gosh, we got to have this. Or the risk is high." Blah blah blah. Um, yeah, it's a great point. Great point. Well, sir, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, thank you for writing for proceedings, uh, for being the chair of our board, and for your time today on the show. Uh, for our listeners, our, our uh, guest today has been the former Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work. He's the chair of the uh, Board of Directors, the Naval Institute. His article is in the December 2021 proceedings. It is titled, A Slavish Devotion to Forward Presence Has Nearly Broken the U.S. Navy. And sir, I'll sign off instead of with our normal uh, uh, victory begins at the Naval Institute. I'll say Parabellum because that's the uh, that's how your article ends, and I think it's yeah. a great uh, a great tagline. So, thanks again for writing for us. Thanks for having me on the show. This episode has been brought to you by the members of the U.S. Naval Institute. For more, go to usni.org/join.